This is Beatitudes Radio. My name is Tony Manier. I am the pastor at the Church of the Beatitudes on the corner of Glendale Avenue and 7th Avenue. Glendale and Ave- 7th Avenue. Sorry about that. I got that mixed up. <laughs> and we came up with this idea of creating a live worship podcast. So if you have chosen to join us live, you can see us on YouTube on Facebook, the church's YouTube and Facebook site, or even on our website. You can watch us live later on in the week. This will come out as a podcast. Our goal was to create something in a worship format that was just a little bit different. And I am joined by my partner, Janelle Taphorn. Good morning, Tony. Good morning. Start of another week. That's right. I'm ready. ready. Whether you like it or not, it's here. All right. <laughs> It's a beautiful day. It, it is. is. Good. I, it's supposed to be 89 degrees this morning. I mean, really? this today. Today, 89, 89 degrees. Yes. No, don't say so. Yeah, and then it's going to cool back down into the 70s. Okay, that's better. So we can't complain. Okay, you're right. <laughs> today, our theme is going to be focused upon Jesus, the man or the myth. I'm not sure what, in particular, your view is of Jesus. If you see him as divine, if you see him strictly as a human being, or perhaps a mixture of both. But if you are familiar with the name Jesus, I would imagine that that evokes a wide variety of different ideas in your mind and thoughts and feelings. And in fact, Joseph M. Scriven, back in 1855, was thinking about Jesus and thinking also about his mother. He was living in Canada, and his mother was in back home in Ireland. So he wrote a poem to her to give her a sense of encouragement. And it said, What a friend we have in Jesus. When that poem came out, many kind of chided him and felt like it was too uh, emotional, ooey-gooey. <laughs> but but it lasted. Um, ooey gooey? Ooey gooey. That kind of that, <laughs> I don't know what else to, to just describe it. <laughs> kind of that soft emotional feel. Warm and fuzzy. Yeah. There you go. Warm and fuzzy. Better than ooey gooey? I guess. You think so, huh? I guess. Maybe. But what's amazing is that the poem, the, the poem stuck, and it became a hymn, and it's found in the majority of hymnals today still. And so I would like you to take the time as you listen to this first song to reflect upon the life of Jesus for you. And as you consider that, and as you listen to these to this song, think about what emotional response it evokes within you. And so please have this time of reflection as you listen to our first song. Thank you. 
wanting to let you know that if you want to make comments or have any questions, we are watching. And you can go to our YouTube uh, chat box or the Facebook chat box and type those questions in. You can also uh, text on your phone to 480-389-4974. And I'm watching for comments, and we will respond. Also, if you're watching this after the fact, when it's not live, but just recorded, you can still submit your comments and questions, and we will get back to you. Just send them to me at media at beatitudeschurch.org. And now I'm going to uh, transfer into scripture this morning. So I am going to read from Matthew 23, verses 1 through 12. This is a warning against hypocrisy. Then Jesus said to the crowds and to his disciples, The teachers of the law and the Pharisees sit in Moses' seat, so you must be careful to do everything they tell you. But do not do what they do, for they do not practice what they preach. They tie up heavy, cumbersome loads and put them on other people's shoulders, but they themselves are not willing to lift a finger to move them. Everything they do is done for people to see. They make their phylacteries wide and the tassels on their garments long. They love the place of honor at banquets and the most important seats in the synagogues. They love to be greeted with respect in the marketplaces and to be called rabbi by others. But you are not to be called rabbi, for you have one teacher, and you are all brothers. And do not call anyone on earth father, for you have one father, and he is in heaven. Nor are you to be called instructors, for you have one instructor, the Messiah. The greatest among you will be your servant. For those who exalt themselves will be humbled, and those who humble themselves will be exalted. A young man from Church of the Beatitudes came home one summer from college, and he spent much of his vacation in thoughtful exploration of the New Testament. By the summer's end, he was very perplexed, and he came to see our founding minister here at Church of the Beatitudes, Bill Nelson, and he said to him, I've read the Gospels carefully and the rest of the New Testament, and I must ask you, am I mistaken when I say that I've discovered more than one Jesus, something I've never, ever seen before. Bill Nelson replied, nope, you're not mistaken at all. For even before the various writings that would become the New Testament had been completed, Jesus was already being interpreted differently by different persons. We have a thing here in Phoenix, Arizona called First Friday. For the last year, it hasn't been occurring because of COVID. But pre-pandemic and hopefully post-pandemic, it will start up again. First Friday on Roosevelt Row, it's an art venue that is made live right there on the street. But what's fascinating is that there's always one or two individuals standing on the corner talking about Jesus. And I remember one in particular, as I was walking by, he looked at me and he said, do you, do you believe in Jesus? Do you love Jesus? Do you know Jesus as your personal savior? And to be honest, I, I didn't know how to answer him because I had no idea which Jesus he was talking about. You see, if you read the Bible, and especially the gospels carefully, as that young man did, you'll see it. In one moment, Jesus seems to endorse the Mosaic law, and in the next, he calls it into question. In one instance, he seems to show interest in the Hebrew scriptures, and then next, he insists that it's not enough. On one occasion, 
he endorses family concerns, and in the next, he's at startling odds with his own mother and his four brothers and sisters. And again, if you read the Gospels carefully, we cannot find a clear and consistent picture of Jesus. But then again, we do have four Gospels, four really quite different ways of looking at Jesus. And that really shouldn't surprise us, right? For example, if I were to hand you two biographies of Franklin D. Roosevelt, and one was written by a diehard Republican, and the other by a devout Democrat, I think you might ask, were there two different Roosevelts? So imagine, it is understandable that Jesus, a man who possessed enormous charismatic power, would be interpreted differently even by those that were closest to him. And that process of interpretation has continued unabated ever since. Now, if that wasn't enough, add also into the mix that not every word attributed to Jesus seems to have actually been spoken by him. And not every event surrounding the gospel accounts happened exactly as they are described. You see, in years of oral transmission, storytelling in reality, his followers sometimes embellished events. They enlarged upon his words. Now, for those of us, or those of you, who believe in Bible free from type of any type of error and prefer a more literal reading or understanding of the Bible, this idea may prove to be quite problematic. However, for me, it's not a problem. Now, this is not the sermon or the time to share with you why it is not a problem for me. So if what I've just shared with you is true, then what can we say definitively or for certain about Jesus, the man? Number one, he was raised in a peasant village. Number two, he began his m public ministry by going to John the Baptist to be baptized. That, when you stop and think about that, that is powerful. In fact, it's actually quite embarrassing for the early followers of his. Because John the Baptist, what he was talking about, what he was preaching about, was the idea of repentance and forgiveness of sin. Now, there are some individuals who would say, well, Jesus really never sinned. He was just affirming baptism. Well, that's reading, that's interpreting the text in a particular way. There's nothing there that says that. So we could walk away believing that Jesus went there and began his ministry, partaking in something as a rite of forgiveness of sins and repentance. Number three, Jesus became popular with most people. There's one scholar who irreverently says that Jesus was a kind of party animal. The amount of time that he spent in being accused as a drunkard and a glutton. Today, that would probably be to an extreme. Instead, I would say that Jesus was very people-oriented. And then last of all, it appears that during his public ministry, Jesus really didn't get along with his own mother and brothers and sisters. None of these observations that I just shared with you is actually something radically new. It's just right there in the text. But what is new is a different idea when it comes to the picture of who Jesus is. And I want to share with you four ideas that might be new to you, something perhaps you haven't thought about. Number one, Jesus did not endorse the cultic characteristics of his inherited religion. When you read the Old Testament, there are some people who conjecture that the Hebrew Bible is really about the land. 
why Israel should have the land that it does. It's God gives it to them. It's their given right. And in that way, in the Hebrew Bible, you almost have this idea that God is like this celestial real estate agent who hands Israel this land. They lose it, but then they get it back. Jesus appears in the Gospels to have no interest in this notion whatsoever. He has no devotion to the idea of one chosen people. No view that his people had some special claim on God and that no other people and no other religion could have that kind of connection. Jesus doesn't seem to support that. Another thing that I find quite interesting, the second one is that the evidence is startling and quite persuasive, although terribly disturbing for some. You ready for this? That Jesus probably made no claims about himself. Now, we do know that he talked a lot about a kingdom of God, and his followers talked a lot about him. Jesus talked a lot about how life should be lived today. His followers later on would talk a lot about a promised life in the hereafter. He talked about what it is like to live in God's presence here and now. His followers on the other side, they talked about some future day when Jesus would come again. Third thing, Jesus was fond of criticizing the religious leaders of his day and says of them that they are all talk and no action. In fact, he censors them for creating a spate, a spat of religious rules and regulations which only burden and do not help the people. In the text that was read for us, you see that. And here's what must have caused so much trouble for Jesus. And that was that Jesus said that God's presence did not need to be mediated to the people by a priest or a temple or a religious institution. Imagine that. That was the predominant way in which religion at that time was communicated. It was the temple. It was the priest. And when you talk about power shifting, Jesus says that isn't needed. No wonder he got himself in trouble. And finally, we find another startling notion. And it is that relationships for Jesus are more important than rules. Now, I don't think Jesus ever supposed that we could dispense with all rules, not that some are not helpful. But what Jesus did say was that relationships with one another, with God, that is what is most important. So given these four things that I just shared with you, I want to ask you, are you comfortable with this picture of Jesus? These ideas that Jesus seems to have endorsed? If I'm honest with you, I have some concerns. Because some of the things that I just shared with you, they kind of make me nervous. For example, I'm, in tr I'm somewhat troubled by this notion that relationships come first and are really what life is all about. Now, it's not that I'm against personal rela interpersonal relationships. The reason why is because if I really listen to what Jesus says about the importance of relationships, then that means that I am asked to be a loving person, to go the second mile, to turn the other cheek, to care about what happens even to those that I don't like, my enemy. And so the simplest way to have Jesus without all these difficult demands 
is to turn Jesus into some kind of Christ figure. And by doing that, I can kind of keep him off to this distance, kind of a safe distance away from me. Perhaps that is why some see Jesus, first and foremost, as the Christ, their Savior. That, for them, is most important. They need to believe that. It's how the question about how you live your life, well, yeah, that's essential. But getting saved, that's what's really important. That is a matter of life and death. And so if I can put Jesus out there as a savior, then all I have to do is believe that he, in certain things about him, his being God, and ex believe that and accept him as my savior, and then that's the most important thing. So which do you prefer? Jesus as the Christ, created over time by his followers in the church, or do you prefer Jesus, the historical man, who focuses on a new, challenging, and even fulfilling way of living life right now? Think about that as you hear this song by our guest guitarist, Jacob.
Jacob. That was beautiful. <laughs> that guy is gifted. I agree. I so appreciate that. <laughs> I would like to open it up for a little bit of discussion and dialogue. You've got my brain of thinking. All right. Let's, what do you? <laughs> what do we have out there? I want to pass it or like start way way back at the beginning of the service. Something you mentioned. You said Jesus as myth. Yes. What do you mean by that? Because when I think of myth, mm -hmm. I think of um, not true. Oh, that's just a myth. So explain what to me what you mean by myth. Jesus well, as myth. Right. I think if we look at the Gospels as being a, his, a history of the life of Jesus, mm -hmm. then I think we've got some serious problems. Why? Because of just the, the differences in each of the presentations of Jesus' life. Yeah. If you read in Matthew, a certain aspect of Jesus is emphasized. Ma the Gospel of Mark has a different emphasis. Um, the Gospel of John mm -hmm. is different than all the other three. Right. So each of them are focusing on a different aspect. Um, one of them I remember very early on seeing was that when you think about what was written over the cross, we have different wording depending upon the Gospels. Mm. So if you read it as history, you got a problem there. Right. So instead, when we s talk about Jesus as myth, I think mm -hmm. the main idea we're focusing on is not that he was not a historical figure. Oh, okay. But rather, now, again, there are some that say he wasn't. Right, I'm sure. I mean, that's, <laughs> that's, an, that's an extreme view. Yeah. But that Jesus was a historical figure, but what we can know about Jesus as the historical person versus the memories and the stories that were presented by his followers decades later, yeah, that's where the challenge is. Okay. That's why I think we see some of these differences. So myth does not necessarily mean that he's not a historical figure. And not true. And, and not true. Okay. But it's Thank something, you for yeah, that. yeah, that's <laughs> the easiest way to explain it. <laughs> well, it just always intrigued me. Um, that kind of leads into my second question. Um, you had mentioned that Jesus makes had made no claims about himself other than uh, the kingdom. Th was it the kingdom the of kingdom God? The kingdom of God, right. correct. So then, is Jesus' divinity a human construct, would you say? That one is a loaded question. I know, because but that's what the heart of this <laughs> right, is right, right. for when many people. If you say that it's purely a human construct, then you have to leave out any type of something, some kind of a spirit or some kind of um, right. force that, that encourages us to see. I guess the easiest way to, for me to explain that was that Jesus had such a charismatic personality that who he was as a human being was so attractive and appealing and authentic to people that when Jesus was no longer present on the earth, the people wrestled with that. Yeah. And one of the things that happens with that is, I think one way that I look at it would be that they would think, you know, if, if God, what is God like? Yeah. And then they looked at the life of Jesus and they said, if God was present in our world, yeah. I imagine he would be like that. Jesus. Yes. And so I think, and again, think about it. There, it, it took a long time for the, the early church to come to this idea that Jesus was God. Yeah. It wasn't like his first followers immediately said, oh, he's God. It, it, it developed over time because they were trying to understand this phenomena that they experienced in the man of Jesus. Mm -hmm. And then it's like, how do we make sense of the, what we're seeing here? Yeah. And then uh, slowly in time, he becomes known as God. When was the idea of salvation then? Was that from day one? Uh, like... Well, I think it, it, it part of it goes back to, I think, especially, for example, in the Gospel of Matthew, the Gospel of John, when you read those, you do have this idea of salvation. And part of that is tied into trying to make sense of Jesus as a Jew. Mm -hmm. And what the Jewish culture and their religious beliefs. And so they're talking about Jesus as a Jew, and yet at the same time, they're trying to make sense of this. And so one of the things is, is to use the language and the words and the imagery 
from the Jewish community mm-hmm. and apply that to Jesus. And just as there was a sacrificial system in the Old Testament, that becomes something in the New Testament. So this idea of salvation through Jesus was something that developed as they begin to contemplate who Jesus was. And for me, esoteric language and doctrines and all of that kind of separates Jesus um, spiritually, my connection to him as a man. But I still want him to be holy. Yeah, and I I hear you because I know for me, yeah, I grew up very much believing that Jesus fully divine, hundred percent God, hundred yeah. percent man. Right. I used to be a professor at a uh, conservative religious college, and I remember one of my students saying to me, "They said, y- you know, Jesus never died." And I said, "Well, wait, what? wait, wait, what do you mean?" <laughs> That doesn't make sense. Right. And he said, no, 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 no. Jesus never died. Mm -hmm. Because if Jesus is God, then God can never die. Okay. So Jesus never died. That's logical. Well, I gave him the (laughs) typical answer that I had been taught and was Uh considered to be the right answer. Right. And that was, well, the human side of Jesus died. Yeah. And his divine side stayed alive. And it went into, like, hibernation. (laughs) Okay. And in my mind, I'm thinking, why did this kid ask me this question? (laughs) Because it started making me think about all that. Right. And I think that's where that was that question, literally, from this college student over, you know, 20 years ago, started making me think about Mm -hmm. this whole idea of what we mean by Jesus being divine and God and also a human being. And for me, the more Jesus became, the, I, I emphasize the, the humanity of Jesus, the more I found myself attracted to him. Really? Oh, yeah. Okay. I mean, to, to do some of the things that he did and say some of the things that he did, the, even those four that I just shared with you, I mean, yeah, y- that's why he that didn't live very long. For some people, it's a lot safer. Oh, yeah. To put him in that um, box. I agreed. Of that divinity box, I guess yeah. you want to call it. Then to, tw- to question the integrity of the Bible or his, ge- his divinity. I don't, think we, I don't think we have to. I don't think we have to question the integrity of the Bible. Okay. I think we just have to read the Bible. Right. But and if when you, you interpret it. W- but when you read the Bible, mm-hmm. that's where the problems arise. <laughs> now, I, I think a lot of you look Don't at... Don't discourage reading the Bible. No, I would encourage it. <laughs> okay. I would very much encourage it. I think what happens is, if we're, if we're honest, mm. a lot of Bible studies that are done through churches are you buy a book, mm-hmm. and the book gives you these questions and these, these uh, interpretations of the text, and then Commentary. you go and you fill it in th- the, the answers. Right. I mean, the thing that messed me up I mean, just being very honest, what messed me up was reading the Bible carefully. Mm. I mean, literally reading very, very carefully. Without any guidance, no, 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 commentary. No, no. Well, no, I think there's, you have to look for information. Right. But you got to start first with the text for yourself and just read it. And yeah. then as you read it and then you have questions, then you begin to think, I wonder what this person says about this. And so I would read a conservative view. Yeah. And then I would read a liberal view. Yeah. And then I would have to make a decision for myself. Okay. But again, the more that I actually read the Bible again and again and again, mm-hmm. it, it doesn't question the integrity. It just makes it realize that this is a very complex document. Yeah. But also a very amazing and powerful, intriguing <laughs> document that you keep wanting to come back to. Yes. Agreed. <laughs> I'm still wrestling with, with I, I feel like we're stripping him of his divinity. And maybe that's my conservative background, I guess. What, what, let, me, let me ask you this. If you no longer believe that Jesus was God, yeah. what difference would that make for you? Well, I, I, like I said, I come from a conservative background, so salvation then is in my little voice in my head saying, hmm, 
if you don't believe in Jesus, you're not going to go to heaven and be right. saved. <laughs> right. And and I'm not saying in, that I'm not here to tell people what to believe about Jesus. Okay. If he was divine or human or a combination of both. Mm -hmm. That isn't my I don't feel like that's my responsibility. My responsibility is to to encourage people to think about things. But going back to what you just said about in my mind, somehow this is related to salvation. Yeah. One of the things that hit me was that I have this mind. Mm -hmm. And if I use it to the best of my ability and am authentically true to my ideas and my thinking, mm -hmm. if I get the wrong answer. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, There's you're talking about you're right? talking about flunking the ultimate test, right? right? It's one thing if you flunk a test when you're in grade school <laughs> or in college, you don't pass going. the course. For many people, if they come to the wrong answer, that has serious ramifications. Yes. Therefore, it's actually discouraged to think about these things. True. Yeah. And instead, I think we have been called to be true to ourselves. And it doesn't mean that we don't expose ourselves to other people's ideas and are willing to adjust and change sure. and modify. I agree. But I think we just have to be honest with what we see and do the best that we can with the information that we have that is available to us. Yeah. So I'm not going to sit here and tell someone that if they believe in one particular way of Jesus that that they are right or they are wrong. That's where yeah. they're at in their journey. And I know some people would disagree very fervently with me on that. And they right. would say that it has to be. That's them. Okay. But for me, I think I have to allow them that freedom just as I, because I, that's the freedom I want for myself. Yeah. So. I get messed up when I think about how we're, we're to be God's hands and feet here in the world. So our, our, our uh, humanity is our divinity. Yeah. Right? That's a great way of saying it. So <laughs> that's still, that, that, that helps put Jesus if he's as we are a man human that that makes it easier for me to to put my wrap my head around yeah I would agree I mm -hmm. most definitely would agree with that so is that it that's it fantastic yeah all right well Jacob you got a number another number for us <laughs>
Thank you again, Jacob. I really have appreciated you being here with us. I appreciate it. In this podcast, we have tried to encourage you to think about Jesus. Not trying to discount him. In fact, doing just the opposite. To take him serious. In however way that you see Jesus. Because it is life-changing. The man was a phenomenal being, even if of only a portion of what we hear about him in the Gospels is accurate. So I hope you will find the inspiration to take the time to look at Jesus. Use that as a way of reflecting upon the choices and the way in which you live your life today. As you go into this another week, though, I want to offer you a blessing. May you be blessed with a sense of serenity. To have a sense of peace of what it is that is on your plate right now, what life has given you, and your willingness to accept it, if, especially if you can't change it. But then also may you be blessed with a sense of courage. Courage to change those things that you can. Courage to be the type of person that you desire to be and to make those changes, to align yourself with those things, to live a life of authenticity. Then may you also be blessed with a spirit of love, a love that is innate within you, and that you will find the ability to love yourself and accept yourself, and then out of that, that you will be able to love and make love real for others. Have a great week. Amen.